you can count when you're happy. One, two, three, four, you can count when you're sad. One, two, three, four, five, or count when you're frightened. One, two, three, four, five, six, count when you're mad. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ah, counting is wonderful. Counting is marvelous. Counting's terrific. And how Once again, we're stealing from horror films as we've got a fire starter, Coach Walt Arnold, possibly the most over-the-top extreme of self-absorbed high school coach I've ever seen. He has a fiery temper, so naturally he's got kryptonite in the sauna, and he turns into a literal hothead. I guess it's not really any more contrived than getting powers from some experimental LSD-type hallucinogen. He's obsessed with his high school football coaching legacy, and he's not exactly living in the real world. But hey, this is a town where everyone's in denial about media rocks giving people superpowers and just how big their town really is, so that's par for the course. His students are caught cheating on a test, but we discover that he actually supplied them with the answers, so he starts losing his cool a lot. Ha, ha. Ha. Huh. Setting a lot of school property on fire and blowing his cover. Meanwhile, Coach Walt sees Clark throw a football really hard so he convinces him to defy his father and join the team to replace one of his players who got benched. Clark uncharacteristically takes some initiative, plays football, and tells his father he can't do anything about it, which is one of the rare moments when a kid tells his dad that and it's actually true. I guess being a teenager with superpowers has its advantages. And everybody else is telling their folks where to stick it to. Lana decides maybe there's more to life than cheerleading and quits the squad, despite her self-absorbed aunt, who seems nearly as into her and Alana's mother's legacies as cheerleaders as Coach Walt is about football. I wonder what she'd do if she had fire powers. And Lex goes against his dad, who wants him to cut 20% of his workforce, so he decides to hire 20% instead. We get to watch them fence for it, which is awesome, and Lex loses. But he ends up doing what he wants by the end anyway. Clark and Chloe go up against Coach Walt, who nearly burns Chloe alive and locks Clark in a room with kryptonite. And I like how these crypto freaks don't ask any questions. Hmm, he ran in there and tried to stop me, and suddenly he's really, really sick. Oh, well, lucky for me. But Jonathan comes to the rescue, and Clark confronts the coach again, which results in him doing the only thing he can do now that he knows about Clark's powers. He burns himself alive. Jonathan and Clark make up. Lex and Lionel don't. Lana loses her job waiting tables and discovers she's not good at much of anything. She and Clark have their token bonding moment, then credits. Despite a bunch of silly with the football coach, this is a surprisingly solid episode, and a good example of what the series could have been overall. Less emphasis on superpowers, more emphasis on the family dynamic. The episode is really about something, and yay for some competent paralleling of plot threads. It's an exploration of children rebelling against their parents, the motivations that lead to those rebellions, the way different kind of parents deal with that, and the different possible outcomes and consequences. We've got three very different people who all go against their parents for different reasons, and it isn't just the same scenario played out over and over again. You get the sheltering father trying to keep his son from compromising himself, in this case the unusual circumstance of worrying that his son will show off superpowers on a football field, and his son rebels because he's confident that he can protect himself and everyone else and he doesn't want to be punished for being different. And you've got Lana, in a rare episode where I almost kind of like her, who doesn't want to be a stereotype, and it's the opposite situation from Clark because, because her mother wants her to stay in an extracurricular and follow in her footsteps. Finally, there's Lex, an adult on his own in the controlling parent situation, where his father and boss has given him the Smallville plant, but is micromanaging it. The end of this thread is really fitting for Lex. He's the only one of the three who doesn't come to some kind of understanding with his parent, but ultimately, after much consideration, defies him completely without any kind of compromise. This leads to my favorite line in the episode, when Lionel says, You only get one. Lex says, one what? And Lionel responds with, one chance to defy me. This is one of many examples where we get that stark contrast between the Kents and the Luthers, which helps to very convincingly explain why Clark and Lex will inevitably have such very different worldviews and thus will become bitter enemies. This being a formulaic Freak of the Week show, I like that we're starting to get some variety in the Crypto Freaks. The first two were high school kids, and now that we see that, as it should, this meteor stuff can affect anybody. Too bad this trend won't really hold. Also, as with Greg Arkin last week, we've got a character who was already unstable before Kryptonite got into his system. Now, I don't think every single story conflict needs to center around some homicidal, superpowered freak. Sometimes it seems like the only problems anybody has in Smallville are murder or love triangles. But if the bad guy has to be a killer, we need to buy that he has the capacity for this. Otherwise, he's not really a character. If every person affected by Kryptonite goes nuts, they're all the same. And they might as well not even be people. You could just have Clark fight mountain lions, or rock monsters, or megazords every week, and it'd be the same difference. At the same time, Coach Walt is, as I said, an extreme stereotype. He's that coach who's been working at a high school so long he's lost all perspective, and by creating an ultra-exaggerated version, the episode does a pretty good commentary on a real problem in public schools, and that's working fairly well. 
Buddy, people are being proactive. Sure, they're all going against the parents, but their motivations and intentions are all understandable, even when they're misguided. Considering all the pining away for Lana Clark has been doing the last couple episodes, it's nice to see him focusing on something else. If only he'd go after Lana with the vigor that he goes after football here. And I bet Jonathan would sign that permission slip. The demise of Coach Walt is easy, unexplained, contrived, and pointless. Anytime the show has to do something solely to keep Clark secret from the public, you're probably going to hear me use the word contrived. And it doesn't have to be. When Clark's got the coach cornered and he knows he's finished, he just broils himself alive. Why? He hasn't seemed suicidal up until now. He also hasn't seemed even remotely remorseful for helping his students cheat, burning his handprint into a kid's arm, trying to kill the principal in a car fire, and trying to kill Chloe by setting the torch on fire. Yep, third episode, and they've already set the Smallville torch on fire. Why couldn't he have had a moment of clarity, decided, I've really taken this too far, I'm only in this for myself, even though I keep throwing around the phrase educating young people, I could maybe have bought a sacrificial suicide, even if it was entirely unnecessary, since we've got a man of extremes here with no patience at all. I just wanted a moment where he realized how over the edge he'd gone. I do really like Lana trying new things and trying to go beyond stereotypes, but at the same time, this is really the foundation for what will become a deep, deep hole the writers can't get themselves out of. What the heck? are we supposed to do with Lana Lang? And I think part of it is that they went the she is in over her head route. You ever notice how nobody is kind of anything in the show, by the way? If Clark can't fly, he's got to be afraid of heights. If Chloe's a journalist, she's got to be a genius, and she's got to be able to hack in anything just because research is part of her job. And later on, you've got Jarrell, who can't just be a great scientist, he's got to have cosmic godlike borderlining on magic type abilities despite being dead. So of course Lana can't be sort of bad at working at a coffee shop, she's got to completely suck at it. And so it's pretty unbelievable later when she's running one of her own, and I'll go more into that when we get there. All of this makes it pretty obvious that Miller and Go really had no idea what they wanted to do with this character when they got started. And questions to ask Jarrell when I get to heaven, I've really only got one this week, and that is, who uses Meteor Rocks in their sauna? Why is there no explanation whatsoever as to how the kryptonite got there, and why Coach Walt has no problem with it? Is he using it on purpose? People use kryptonite all the time later on to enhance all kinds of other things. Maybe he just likes the smell. Maybe it makes the fire hotter. Maybe he just likes how it glows in the dark. Surely he's got to notice this toxic-looking green smoke coming up out of it. I just want some reason for why it's there. And let's take a look at the scoreboard. We've got one Crypto Freak with Coach Walt Arnold, who gets his powers with Kryptonite in a sweat box, and that makes him a fire starter. That brings our total to three. We've got one person who goes conveniently unconscious, so they can't see that Clark has powers. That's Principal Quan this time, and that puts our total to four. And that happens with a car explosion, but not a car crash, so we don't get any new car crashes this week. We've got one instance of Clark being affected by green Kryptonite, which brings our total to seven. And we've got one bad guy who dies in a fight with Clark, and that brings our total just to one. Uh, this category is back down uh, to one for the total as Greg Arkin, in fact, did not die in Metamorphosis as he appears in the season 10 episode of Homecoming, which several viewers reminded me of. I have, by the way, seen that episode and thought about that, but at this point in the series, we really thought he did indeed die. Nevertheless, I've gone ahead and retracted it now. As I said in our recent Geek Pollution update, I've taken a few categories out that are either too subjective to keep up with or just not really worth it. So if I don't bring up a category in an episode something fits in that I've done before, I've probably axed it. Don't worry though, plenty of new categories to come. I'm starting to think that fewer things to count equals better episodes. I'll keep that theory in the back of my mind as we continue. I'm going to go ahead and give this episode, believe it or not, a 3.5 out of 4. Despite all the silliness, uh, I really liked how the subplots all worked together and um, I think the Crypto Freak could have been better, but overall I kind of liked him. Was there any item I missed in any category? Send me a personal message on Geekvolution on YouTube, and I'll be sure to add it to the count. I'm Captain Logan. Consider this episode. Count it. 